This week on Mill Street, we travel to the Middle East. We start with salmon crema. It's a quick skillet dish with minced cilantro, paprika, and cumin. It's easy and also delicious. And then we take a cue from Armenian cooking. It's a version of tabbouleh, a bulgur mint tomato salad. And finally, we do a tangerine almond cake, which is infused with a sugar syrup. It's absolutely spectacular. Stay tuned for meals from the Middle East right here on Milk Street. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. You know, for most of us, salmon is probably our go-to fish, and we've cooked it dozens of different ways. A few years ago, I was leafing through one of Yotam Otolenghi's books, and he had a recipe for salmon crime, which is a spicy fish dish. And then I was chatting with a woman in New York, born a Tel Aviv, a restaurateur, whose name is Enot Edmundy, and she was talking about the same dish. So I said, wait a minute, this is something we should try. So it's essentially a spicy fish dish. You could use garlic cloves, harissa, whatever kind of spice you want. But we thought that made a lot of sense for Milk Street. Take something basic and add spice. That's right, Chris. So we decided to make our own version of salmon crime. We started with center cut fillets of salmon. And when you go to the store, you either want to get a piece of salmon and, and cut it yourself into about six ounce portions. This recipe is for four. Or ask the fishmonger to cut it into evenly sized pieces. This comes together really quickly on the stovetop, but we obviously want the fish to cook at an even rate. So as you said, there's many versions of this. Some have harissa, some have many, many cloves of garlic. We wanted to make it so it was really easy to make with supermarket staples and a lot of pantry ingredients. So our version has a 14 ounce can of tomatoes is kind of the base of the tomato sauce, but we first brown some really delicious aromatics like jalapeno and garlic. We have cumin and coriander. So to get started, I'm just gonna season our fillets. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind, this is just a tablespoon of olive oil. If you could heat it up over a medium high heat for me. Now our scallions, we're just gonna top and tail these. But we're gonna use this in two parts, Chris. So we're gonna use the white and light green parts, sauteed with our jalapeno and our garlic. And then we're gonna save the green tops and use those to garnish at the end. Okay, so I think this is just about starting to shimmer. I'm gonna add one jalapeno. We've taken out the seeds and the ribs, but if you like it really spicy, you could leave those in. I have three cloves of garlic that we've sliced up very thin. And then I'm gonna have my two little piles of scallions here. The whites and light green part are gonna go in now. We're gonna cook it for just about two minutes until it starts to get a little bit golden brown. So we're starting to get a little brown there, and we don't want our garlic to get bitter, so I'm not gonna let this go too much farther. I'm going to add a teaspoon of whole coriander, a teaspoon of whole cumin seed, and three quarters of a teaspoon of smoked paprika. And using those whole spices gives you texture as well as flavor. When spices are used, it's good to bloom them in a little bit of oil like this. It really helps release the oils and the aroma. If you were to just throw this into the tomato sauce without blooming them in the fat first or toasting them, you wouldn't get nearly as much flavor. Okay. All right, so that's smelling really great. I'm gonna add one 14.5 ounce can of tomatoes. Look out. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. So are these just whole tomatoes, diced tomatoes? What were they? They are diced tomatoes. Okay. I'm gonna add a half a teaspoon of kosher salt, a quarter teaspoon of pepper. Bring this back up to a simmer. And now, 
I'm gonna nestle in the salmon skin side up. So when we were first working on this recipe, we cut off the skin, but we realized that it's super easy to just peel it off at the end. And so that way it locks in a little bit of the moisture and you don't have to, you know, futz with a boning knife to try to, to cut off the skin without losing some of your beautiful salmon. And Chris, if you just wanna put the lid on there, we've turned the heat down to medium. This is just gonna take six to eight minutes. We'll check it with a thermometer. We're looking for somewhere between 115 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Could, could this recipe be simpler, no. you think? Okay, <laughs> really I just, just wanna know, okay. Okay, Chris, it's been six minutes. Can I have you take the lid, actually? Thank you. So we are looking here for between 115 and 120. And perfect, we've got it. Now, we like our salmon to be a little translucent on the inside. So if you like your salmon well done, you could certainly, you know, take it off the heat and leave the lid on for just a couple more minutes to let it continue cooking that really... Um... So it's really chalky. <laughs> That's what we want. Yeah, chalky to each their own, right? So now we're gonna take off the skin. Remember I told you about that really great trick where it just peels right off and you don't have to mess with a boning knife or losing any of your delicious salmon. So slick, right? There you go. There we go, there's one. No, it's true, if you take it off before you cook it, you take off a lot of the meat of the fish yeah. as well. So now I'm gonna transfer this to the serving platter. And we're gonna do skin side down, because obviously this isn't our best look here with the skin side up. I'm gonna clean up this platter for you too, Chris. You know how much I care. I do. About I platters do. and them being You're, clean. And they call you the Vermont food stylist, right? No. Properly cooked food always looks good on the plate, as a famous Italian cook once said, Mr. Bugiali. While our salmon just rests over on the platter, I'm gonna bring this back up to medium heat. I just wanna simmer it for a minute or two to kinda of get rid of some of that extra liquid. All right, and see how it's leaving a little trail. I think we are good to go. So I'm gonna pull it off the heat. And as is the Milk Street tradition, I'm gonna to add tons of herbs. So we have a quarter cup of cilantro leaves, and two tablespoons of mint. I'm gonna stir that up. You know what I love about America? You can be around two years and now we have a tradition. Right? Already, we have an early tradition here at Milk Street. And I mean, this entire very flavorful sauce is mostly stuff that you would have on hand. I mean, maybe you need to pick up a jalapeno or go out to the garden and, and pick in a jalapeno. But you've probably got garlic, you've probably got canned tomatoes. You might have some herbs in your fridge. Hmm. Now we reserved those scallion tops. I'm gonna sprinkle these over the top. And then for a little added richness at the end, I'm just gonna drizzle olive oil over the whole thing. Gives mm. it a little sheen and richness. All right, shall I serve you some? Sold me. You're always the one doing the serving. I think it's my turn. I get the big piece. Well, you do the cooking. So thank you. For you, lemon. Yes, please, thank you. And we'll probably need this. I'm gonna grab a little of this extra because I'm not gonna let that sit on a platter. Right, and I mean, you could steam some rice, you could drag a baguette through it, you know, starch of your choice to soak up this really so, delicious sauce. So we're, you know, people always talk about quick recipes and they're not quite as quick as they say they are. This is quick. This, this is, is 20 great. minutes, right? I mean, tops. And Chris, you can see when you, when you bite into it, there's none of that chalkiness that you were worried about. It's really a little mm. bit translucent. It's still firm and very moist. Mm. And I like using the whole seed, because I just got a little bite of that, you know, you get a little bite of that seed and you get a burst of flavor, sort of like a, a mold in sea salt, because you get that big crunch of something. So it really is terrific, yeah. And it's kind of nice to get that earthy coriander and then the really fresh cilantro mm. leaf, because it's the same plant, you know, and two really different flavors. Delicious. You know, the holy grail of all cooking here at Milk Street as well is to have something that's quick and simple, but it has lots of layers of flavor. You have whole spices, you have fresh herbs, uh, a little bit of garlic, you have a little bit of heat as well, and of course the fish. So it really has everything in, in 20 minutes. This you can do really quick and easily. So salmon crime, an old Sephardic dish, brought back to the present. Simple, fresh, lots of herbs, lots of spice, lots of flavor. So we've learned over many years that authentic tabbouleh is about the parsley, it's not about the bulgur, and that's mostly a parsley salad. But the Armenian version called each is actually about the bulgur, not anything else. So let's make each as a heartier bulgur tomato salad. It absolutely is heartier. And in fact, you're right about the parsley. There's very little parsley in Armenian 
bulgur tomato salad. We'll be cooking our bulgur today in a combination of water as well as tomato paste. And that gives this a really bright color and it makes it a lot thicker and grainier than your tabbouleh. So we're going to mix together three tablespoons of tomato paste along with a cup and a third of water. We'll give it a whisk just to make sure everything is very well incorporated. We'll come back to that a little bit later. We also want to make sure that we cook some of the other elements going into this dish. So we'll set a 10 inch skillet over medium heat and we'll add in two tablespoons of olive oil. And we'll heat this until it begins to shimmer. And at that point, we know we're ready to start sauteing our bell pepper. We've taken one red bell pepper and finely chopped it. And we're going to saute that along with four scallions that we've roughly chopped as well. So that way we get a little bit of onion flavor without being overpowering. So once this shimmers, we'll add in our bell pepper as well as our scallion. So we're only cooking this over medium because we don't want to develop too much brown color and kind of drain this of its vibrancy. We're going to season this as well. Here we have a teaspoon and a half of salt. We'll go ahead and cover this and allow it to cook for five minutes over medium heat. While our peppers and scallions are cooking, we can now take a look at our bulgur. Now, we have two different varieties of bulgur here. One is our coarse bulgur, the other one is our fine bulgur. For this recipe, we want the hearty chew of coarse bulgur, not so much the fine bulgur. Doesn't have that textural interest that we're looking for, and it has a completely different absorption rate, so it won't work for this recipe. And people should just look at it, because I know when I go <laughs> shopping, sometimes they're not labeled well. Mm. They don't go like, coarse bulgur, and then there's fine bulgur. You just have to actually also look at it. Most bulgur packaging now has a little window that you could take a peek at it through. Before we add our bulgur to this dish, we want to bring some aromatics to the game here. So our peppers have been cooking for a little while here. We're now going to add a teaspoon and a half of cumin. That's ground cumin? Ground cumin, along with a teaspoon of Aleppo pepper, which I know is a favorite of yours, Chris. Now we're going to add three garlic cloves, finely minced. It's true I love different kinds of peppers. We, we're stuck on just black, like, telecherry pepper, right? Aleppo pepper is a red pepper, and they're two kinds. Some are a little fruity, mm. which I really like, and other, other types of lepo are just hot and spicy. So when you buy a lepo pepper, if you taste it, the kinds that have a little fruitiness I think are better, but it's a really great pepper. The fruitiness is certainly welcome in this dish. So we're going to allow these to saute for a little bit longer. We could go ahead and add our cup of coarse bulgur, along with that tomato water mixture that we created earlier. So this is all going to fit in here, huh? It's yeah. not going to go brrr, out of the pan? It only takes a 10-inch pan, so there's huh. very, very little cleanup involved. Just going to stir this around to make sure that every grain of bulgur is coated in a little bit of that tomato. And then to that, we'll add one and a quarter teaspoons of kosher salt. Now that we've added the water, the salt, and the bulgur to the pan, we'll bring this to a boil. We'll cover it lower the heat down, and we'll bring it to a simmer for about 12 to 15 minutes. And after those 12 to 15 minutes, we'll remove it from the heat and allow it to sit on its own. Okay. We've let our bulgur sit off the heat for five minutes, and after that, we've transferred it over to a large shallow bowl to spread it out and allow it to cool down just slightly. While it's still warm, we want to add in one tablespoon of one of my favorite ingredients, pomegranate molasses. Me too. We'll just drizzle that an even layer right on top, and then we'll fold it through. You know, years ago, someone told me about pomegranate molasses. I thought it's one of those silly, <laughs> you know, silly ingredients I'm just not going to buy. Uh, now, of course, I have like three bottles at home. It's three things. It's, it's bright, sort of acidic. It's sour, and it's also sweet. I use it in salad dressings. You can put it as a last-minute little, you know, a capful in a stew or a soup. It's one of my go-to secret pantry ingredients, and it's available really in almost every store now. So highly recommend pomegranate molasses. So to this, we will now add in the tomato part of this dish. Here we have a pint of tomatoes that have been halved, and we'll also throw in two scallions that have been thinly sliced into rounds. And finally, three quarters of a cup of mint. Now we toss it together. Boy, that looks good. Right? It's like fireworks of color here, green and red. And you can serve it warm. You can serve it room temperature. But aside on from a that, train in the rain. On a train in on the rain. On a boat with a goat. You can serve it anywhere. <laughs> And that, my friend, is it. It's not it, we're gonna taste it now, oh. are we? Fair enough, fair enough. We'll go ahead and transfer in just a little bit here. 
Is that enough for you? Well, I don't know. I got to taste it first. You know, <laughs> then I'll tell you. Well, here's a fork. I mean, you don't want to prejudge anything. Although sure. it looks, it looks great, right? So. Mm -hmm. Oh, really bright for something that was cooking on the stovetop, right? I think with it, with the mint and the pomegranate molasses and tomatoes, it, it's light actually. So the next time you say tabbouleh, you might want to say each. It's the Armenian version. It's all about the bulgur with some mint and tomatoes. It's light, it's bright, it makes a great summer salad and a great winter salad too. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Erica. Oh, yo, Tom. I'm such a huge fan. It's so nice to meet you, finally. You know, what's really, what's really depressing is you are much more excited to see Yotam than you are to see me. Well, this is Yotam Odolenghi. He's the author of Jerusalem. In fact, he was one of the major inspirations for the beginning of Milk Street, and I've cooked out of all of his books, as I think most I of us have. have. Yotam is famous for many things, but one of the desserts we really love in Jerusalem is a tangerine almond cake. Now, we love it for a couple of reasons. One is it's a simple cake to make. It's a one-layer cake. It's not a three-layer cake. And secondly, it's full of flavor, and there's an infused sugar syrup with bay and mm -hmm. orange juice and other things. So it's a really easy way to get flavor into a cake without making a frosting or a filling. Right. Now, I just want you to know that you get this as a prize <gasps> oh. when we taste the cake. I have to wait that long? You have to wait that long, All but right. you're going to get this later. OK, we great. Okay. Something to look forward to. Yes. The key ingredient to this cake, which makes it so moist and dense, um, is almond flour. And we're going to go ahead and start with two and a quarter cups of blanched almond flour. You want to make sure you get that. Sometimes you can find unblanched almond flour, which means the skins have been left on the almonds, and it just makes the cake a little bit drier. So to this, we're going to go ahead and whisk in two-thirds of a cup of all-purpose flour. But as you can see, most of the flour in this cake is the almond flour. And then we're just going to add a half a teaspoon of baking powder for a little lift. I'm just going to whisk that all till it's well combined. Get rid of any lumps. Okay, now we're going to move over to the next best ingredient in this cake, and that's the tangerines. We really love them for their flavor. They have a really bright, intense citrus flavor. You want to be sure that you're going to pick, though, a nice firm fruit because it's easier to zest, and you also want to have a nice, sharp microplane, so that makes the job a lot easier. And if you can't find tangerines, you can just use regular oranges. So I'm going to finish zesting this last one, but you need about four to five for this recipe, which is a, a tablespoon and a half of zest. So I'm going to go ahead and do this right over the bowl. By the way, that's a tip we picked up from Claire Patak in East London at the Violet Bakery. She actually zested over the bowl, and I zested over the cutting board, and she said, well, you just lost <laughs> all the essential oils onto the board. So this way you actually get all the flavor. And I'm zesting this right into, already I have in here one cup of white sugar, and also two teaspoons of lemon zest. So you can tell already this is going to have a lot of flavor. And then I'm just going to add three quarters of a teaspoon of kosher salt. Okay, so I'm just going to mix this on low for about a minute. And what this does is releases all of the oils in the zest, which really helps to in intensify their flavor. OK, so now you can see if the sugar is like nicely moistened and just beginning to clump. So we're going to add 12 tablespoons of salted butter. And this is room temperature butter because we're going to be creaming it. So we really want it to be nice and pliable to be able to incorporate all the air. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in. And first, I'm just going to mix this on a lower speed just until the butter's all mixed in with the sugar because if I go ahead and turn it on to the medium-high speed, you know, what's going to happen? Sugar's going to fly out of the bowl and you'll get mad at me. And so. What? <laughs> and as soon as that's done, I'm going to turn it up to medium-high. We're going to let this go for a good three minutes till it's very pale and light and fluffy. Okay, this looks good. It's pale, it's fluffy, and now it's time to add our eggs. I have four eggs. I'm going to add them one at a time, and I'm going to scrape down the sides of the bowl as needed. Also very important, these eggs are not cold out of the fridge. I've let them come up to room temperature, and that's important because if I were to add the cold eggs right into this nice, soft, warm, whipped butter, the, the butter, butter would, would just, yeah, it would just harden, and all that air I worked in, it would be gone, and it would be a flat, sad, greasy cake, and I wouldn't get my mask. <laughs> and we're going to add another egg. Now that last egg has been incorporated, we can go ahead and add our dry ingredients. Thank you. Keep the mixer running. All right, we should let this go another 10 seconds or so until it's all combined. All right, that looks great. And as you can see, it's a very thick batter. Mm. And so here we have our pan prepared. This is an eight inch cake pan. It's been buttered very generously, lined with a parchment round and then buttered again. When I worked in bakeries, I was taught you never leave a drop of batter. 
Oh, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to use an offset spatula to even this out because it's so thick. I just want to make sure I get it all the way into the pan to an even layer. Okay, the last thing we're going to do, we're just going to sprinkle the top of the cake with three tablespoons, and these are blanched sliced almonds. This is much easier than putting a layer of frosting on there, isn't it? Well, I, I want to want to say for the record, I have nothing against frosting <laughs> anytime, anywhere, but this is easier. Yeah, it is much easier. And that's it, and this is ready to go. I have an oven preheated at 325 degrees, the rack set in the middle position, and this is gonna bake for about 55 minutes. And if you don't have an eight inch cake pan at home and all you have is a nine inch cake pan, that's fine. You just need to bake it about 10 minutes less for about 45 minutes. Okay. Okay, Chris, while our cake is in the oven, we're gonna go ahead and make our syrup, which is gonna soak the cake after it's done baking. And this is a very simple syrup. All we're gonna do is we're gonna have three tablespoons that we juice those lovely tangerines that we had. And then we're gonna add two tablespoons of lemon juice to add a little bit of acidity so it's not too sweet. And we're adding a third a cup of white sugar. And then this is the best part, three small bay leaves. This adds, no, I love this. So it adds such a wonderful herbal note. I know it seems like you know an ingredient you would use in a soup or something, but it's so wonderful here with the citrus. And that, that was our little Milk Street lanyap, the little thing at the end. <laughs> And we're just going to cook this for medium heat until it comes to a simmer. And you want to stir it a little bit just to dissolve the sugar. And that's basically it. Okay, so our cake has been cooling for 10 minutes. I baked it for 55. I brought my syrup back up to a simmer so it was nice and hot before we soak our cake. I'm just going to turn that off. Before we soak it, we're going to poke it all over with a skewer. Poke it and soak it? Yep, exactly. And the reason we let it cool for 10 minutes is because if we took it right out of the oven, the pan is still too hot and the syrup would sizzle and you know burn to the sides. And you do want to soak the cake while it's still warm though because it absorbs the syrup much better. If it's cold, Well, the syrup if it gets sticky on the sides, you can't get the cake out of the pan. Yes, yes true. I, I know that from personal yeah, experience yeah, actually because I didn't wait 10 minutes. Okay, now I'm going to just brush the syrup all over the top. And this is so great. Not only does it flavor it, but it keeps it super, super moist. You can actually smell, although I'm not a big fan of bay leaves in oh, general. Oh, really? Well, I don't think they really add that much, but in this syrup, they do. They yeah. definitely do. So I'm just brushing all around the top of the cake and letting the syrup soak down into those holes. And I really like the syrup because even though it is a syrup and it's you know sugar-based, the citrus juice really balances out. So it adds a nice little tang. Might be very nice in a cocktail, is what I was <laughs> just thinking. <laughs> Now that's it. It's gonna sit for 30 minutes and then we're gonna come back and take the cake out of the pan. Okay, Chris, after that 30 minutes, I went ahead and took the cake out of the pan. And the way I did that was, I used a greased piece of parchment to cover the top because we did not want to lose any of that wonderful top layer. And because we soaked it, it tends to come off when you cover it with mm -hmm. a plate or something. So I reinverted it onto this platter and then I let it cool for another two hours so it would be ready for you. So now I'm time to eat. Is that your little tiny piece for I you? I know, right? I was going to say, you can always have seconds. There you go. I just smell it. It's, I love that smell. Mm. Oh. oh. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you eat like a pound cake and it's kind of flat when you eat it. Mm -hmm. It has that citrus it and it has the little mm -hmm. bay. And it's got a nice, dense mm. crumb, but it's still very tender. The syrup is, is more concentrated on the top. So on the top, you get the real hit of that syrup. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the bottom half is, is a little bit different, so you get the contrast, right? Right, and the little crunchy nuts, too, mm. at a nice contrast. Oh. So a last thank you to Yota Madalangi for this tangerine almond cake with the bay infused syrup. The bay was our little addition yes. to it. But it's such a great recipe because it's so simple, and that, that syrup really adds a tremendous amount of flavor. Yeah. By the way, you can get this recipe and all the recipes from Milk Street for this season at MilkStreetTV.com. I think I owe you a mask. I think you do. Wait, I'm like, find a mess or a mask. <laughs> Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow.
Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. Fantastic. So this is called uh, Goi Nam Wa, which is these bananas here. Uh, we have something similar to it in the States called burro banana or Thai banana. And he makes a batter. He cooks it in the palm oil for a while, 10, 15 minutes, at a relatively low temperature. I'm not going home. You dig it? I'm here. You have an extra room in your house? Yeah, we do. <laughs>